pleasure to be presenting to you today. I, I'm a last minute call up for my colleague Leah, who is unfortunately ill and unable to, to moderate this webinar. Um, we've started recording the webinar as well, just so you're aware. And thank you very much for, for staying on mute. Um, during the course of this webinar, we really encourage you to send some questions in via the chat box. We'll collate those and have 10 to 15 minutes towards the end of the webinar where we can go through some of the questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but uh, we hope we can get to, to some of those questions. So as you're aware, this is a, a webinar on greenhouse gas accounting and verification for businesses. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you today. Um, just again, to reiterate uh, the webinar preferences, please stay on mute. It, this is a recorded webinar and use the chat function. If we don't get to all the, all the questions, we will get back to you on email as well. Um, my name is John Davis. I'm, I'm hosting today's webinar. Uh, I lead South Pole's uh, business across the APAC region and also work um, closely with our Middle Eastern clients as well. Um, I'm very delighted to be joined by a colleague who works in the same office as, as me in Sydney, Australia, Arjit. Uh, Arjit is our managing consultant across our climate strategies work, which obviously includes our greenhouse gas accounting. And we have Dr. Tarsin Chowdhury. Tarsin is the Senior International Product Manager for Climate Change and Sustainability with Tuvnord. So it's a pleasure to be presenting with you both today. Um, today's format, uh, I'll give a quick introduction to, to the topics. Um, we'll pass to Arjit on the greenhouse gas accounting side from South Pole, and then we'll pass to Tarsin to discuss verification of greenhouse gas inventories. Uh, firstly, a little bit about South Pole. Um, we have been in climate change and sustainability for just over 14 years now. Um, we have a team of around 400 people, um, specialists in sustainability um, around the world. Um, we're present in 18 offices now and rapidly expanding. Um, the, the company very much uh, assists companies corporates and financials around the world understand climate change and a large piece of this as we'll see is understanding greenhouse gas accounting and then enabling them to take action around that so so why i guess why why are we doing this webinar um and what is the need for voluntary climate action um I think even this year we've seen a huge change in particular from from uh, the United States in recognizing this is a critical issue of our time. Um, this graph here really makes the uh, 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 conversation pretty apparent in terms of what needs to be done and how quickly it needs to be done as well. Um, net zero is definitely the the phrase of sustainability, but also the world and We've seen a huge amount of commitments from both countries and large multinationals to um, uh, target a net zero uh, situation by 2050. There's a huge gap in ambition right now, uh, but one of the tools is for companies to really measure and understand where they are now and what they have to do to transition to this low carbon environment. It's not just uh, companies that realize that they have to act, but there's also a huge amount of pressure from a varying amount of stakeholders. Governments ratifying the Paris Agreement and of course committing to net zero. Shareholders, the financial organizations around the world are also forcing hands of many large corporates around the world. Um, we're seeing ambitious actions from global leaders, um, US tech uh, to food multinationals. There is a huge uh, leadership in climate action that we see at the moment. And not forgetting employees who want to work in companies that are doing the right thing and customers, in particular millennials, are willing to pay more for products that are more sustainable. Um, a, a quick highlights package of what we see at South Pole in terms of who's making commitments around the world and what are they doing. Um, I'm not going to go through all these individually, but you can see that from Asia, Middle East, 
America and Europe, there are huge commitments to science-based targets, net zero, and obviously the RE100 pledge, which is 100% renewable energy for your operations. So without any further introduction, it's a pleasure to pass to Arjit to discuss um, the elements of greenhouse gas accounting. Uh, I'll go on to mute Arjit and um, keep going on the slides for you. Thanks for that, John. So uh, good evening, everyone from Sydney. Uh, my name is Ajit Pidbidri, uh, and as John mentioned, I'm a managing consultant here at South Pole, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about the aspects of greenhouse gas accounting for corporations, including the greenhouse gas protocol standard, um, how it can be applied for corporations, and some examples of how it's used in different industries. Um, so firstly, from this slide, I'd just like to quickly cover where carbon footprinting or greenhouse gas accounting, as it's better known, takes place in what we call at South Pole, the climate journey to net zero. Um, so as you can see, uh, carbon footprinting is only the first step in a series of many um, that industries or corporations can take to ultimately become leaders in addressing climate change in their business activities and ultimately becoming net zero. Next slide, please. So I'd like to begin understanding the background to carbon footprinting uh, just by identifying one of the most commonly employed international standards, um, which is the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, so this is the most widely used greenhouse gas accounting tool for understanding, quantifying and managing emissions. Now, there are numerous types of standards under the Greenhouse Gas Protocol made for the three types of greenhouse gas accounting. And these three types of greenhouse gas accounting I'll discuss further in the presentation. Um, so the Greenhouse Gas Protocol establishes five key principles in the Greenhouse Gas Accounting practice. Um, this includes relevance, completeness, consistency, transparency, and accuracy. Next slide, please. So in reporting carbon footprints, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, it, pre it prescribes three primary reporting categories for emissions. Uh, so scope one emissions focus on the direct greenhouse gas emissions that occur from sources that are owned or directly controlled by the company. So for example, um, emissions from combustion in owned or controlled boilers, furnaces, vehicles, um, emissions from chemical production in owned or controlled process equipment, um, and so on. Uh, scope two accounts for greenhouse gas emissions from the generation of purchased electricity. Um, and this is purchased electricity that's consumed by the company. Um, and so purchased electricity is defined as the electricity that is purchased or otherwise brought into the organizational boundary of the company. And they physically occur at the facility where electricity is generated. And finally, scope three, um, often one of the biggest uh, emissions categories. Um, it's a reporting category that allows for the treatment of all other indirect emissions. And so scope three emissions are really a consequence of the activities of the company, but they occur from sources not owned or controlled by the company. Um, now, while it's historically been considered an optional thing under as a reporting category under the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, best practice Greenhouse Gas Accounting, and particularly when focusing on net zero, usually includes some of the material categories as a bare minimum under scope three. Um, and these material categories generally can be business travel, waste, and the extraction and production of purchased materials. Next slide, please. So further to the reporting categories, there are three primary types of greenhouse gas accounting that takes place. And the first and most common type of greenhouse gas accounting is for entities or organizations. And so this focuses upon the emissions across an organization's operations. Uh, and it refers to the calculation of emissions which have already occurred. And the process for entity greenhouse gas accounting involves calculating emissions occurred for a base year or a baseline year, and then comparing it, the future annual calculations against it to identify how emissions are changing over time. The second type of greenhouse gas accounting undertaken is for projects where emissions avoided by a project are quantified. So this involves the estimation of avoided emissions against a baseline comparison through a what if scenario. So for example, if you have a construction of a road and you understand the baseline emissions, you may wanna identify a what if scenario. Um, for example, what if we change the design to minimize material consumption? 
So this would give you an indication of the emissions that you avoid through your project. Uh, and lastly, the third part of, or the third type of greenhouse gas accounting are for products. So many of you may have heard of what a life cycle assessment or LCA is, which combines all the data from past and future emissions across all phases of an individual product or service. So these emissions are then compared with a base year, much like the entity greenhouse gas accounting. However, it's important to note that the first step of creating green products on the market are through product greenhouse gas accounting, where the upstream and downstream emissions are calculated. Now we'll talk about carbon footprinting. Next slide, please. Now, this slide just dictates one of the most basic parts of creating a carbon footprint. So calculating emissions is always linked to any part of your organization, project or product, which involves energy consumption. So a carbon footprint is calculated by multiplying the energy used against an emission factor from a standard or several standards, depending on the type of activity which takes place. So as you can see, there are, there are various types of energy consumed in all parts of a carbon footprint. Another key part of the carbon footprint, which is imperative to understand, is the global war warming potential, otherwise known as GWP for short. Now, most carbon footprints are reported as CO2 equivalent or CO2E. This is a basic unit for all greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, but also methane, nitrous oxide, HFCs, PFCs, and sulfur hexafluoride. Equivalence is created between these using the GWP, the global warming potential of CO2, which is designated as one, and the relative global warming potential of other greenhouse gases against CO2. Next slide, please. So you may ask why, why would you want to undertake a greenhouse gas accounting process and develop a carbon footprint for your organization, project or product? Firstly, you may wanna identify risks associated with greenhouse gas constraints in the future, cost-effective reduction opportunities, or measure and report progress against a set greenhouse gas target. Secondly, you may wanna undertake voluntary stakeholder reporting of greenhouse gas emissions and progress towards greenhouse gas targets, including reporting to government and NGO reporting programs, GSG registries, or eco-labeling and certification. Thirdly, you may want to have you may have government reporting programs which require mandatory reporting at the national, regional, or local level that you must meet. Fourthly, you may want to participate in greenhouse gas markets, either through supporting internal greenhouse gas trading programs or participating in external cap and trade programs or meeting carbon tax requirements. For example, uh, European companies who engage in the European Union emissions trading scheme would undertake carbon footprinting exercises to participate. And finally, you may want to gain recognition for early voluntary action by providing information to support a baseline credit um, or credit for early action. Next slide, please. So before I go on to explain carbon footprinting examples across industries, I'd like to just cover the basic greenhouse gas accounting process in developing your carbon footprint. This is a process commonly applied through South Pole services, but it's often applied across any carbon footprinting exercise in any other organization. So firstly, the boundaries of your organization product or project is determined in the defined scope phase, which involves understanding what emission sources you include and exclude in your footprint. So the emission sources you commonly want to include or exclude boils down to understanding which scope three emission source you include or exclude. Secondly, activity data is collected according to the scope categories you include. So this relates to my earlier slide regarding the energy consumed across your organization, project or product. Activity data refers to any raw data your organization collects for relevant emission sources. This can include electricity consumed across your offices, the number of vehicles your employees use to commute to work a year, the number of IT equipment you purchased in the last year, and so on. Once all this data is collected, a series of emission factors from standards or literature, according to the activity data you provide, are applied to determine the emissions from each of these sources. These are then categorized, visualized through a series of data analytics, and the final carbon footprint is then presented in a final report in the reporting phase. Next slide, please. 
So I'd like to finish up my presentation uh, with a brief coverage of some of the types of data you may consider or collect in determining your carbon footprint and how it may vary according to the industry you work in and the type of greenhouse gas accounting that takes place. So in this example, for a product footprint in the fashion and textile industries, one may consider raw materials production and processing and textile and garment manufacturing in the upstream phase of the supply chain. Uh, operational emissions from offices, retail and distribution centers, as well as the disposal of textiles and garments may be considered in the downstream phase of the supply chain. And in the case of an entity footprint, you may only consider the offices and retail phase of the supply chain and identify any activity data associated directly with your staff for business operations purposes. Next slide, please. In the tourism and aviation industries, uh, in this example, you may consider air travel and accommodation as the two primary sources of emissions for a service footprint. In the case of tourism, uh, food and beverages may also be a key emission source in the service provided. For an entity footprint, these three sources may be related back to your business operations. Um, and air travel would focus strictly on business air travel for your staff, accommodation of your staff if they're traveling for work, and food and beverages consumed at meetings as some examples of an entity footprint. Next slide, please. And finally, like fashion or textile industries, agriculture and food industries would also focus on upstream and downstream phases of the life cycle for a product footprint. However, the types of data you may collect would be different. In this case, crop types and the number of crops planted in the upstream, energy consumed and processing those crops into food or other products in the present, and distribution and disposal of these final products in the downstream would be taken into account. So I'd like to finish my presentation here and I'll pass it on to Dr. Tarsen Chaudhry from uh, to Nord, who will talk about the verification of greenhouse gas inventories. Over to you, Dr. Tarsen. Ajit, thank you very much indeed. Can I be heard? Perfect. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, good uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dependent on uh, where you are in the world. Uh, my name's Tarsen Chowdhury. I'm uh, a lead auditor with Tuf Nord for the past 10 years. Um, Ajit has just given you an extremely detailed and comprehensive presentation on why you should calculate your carbon footprint and how you calculate your carbon footprint. And I intend to spend the next 20 minutes or so just discussing the verification of a carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So, and please, uh, John, just put them all up, please. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to just give you a, a brief introduction to TUF Nord. Some of you may not have heard of us. I then want to get into the real body of the presentation, which is assurance. So what is assurance? What's the process that we follow as verifiers? Why would you do this? What, what's your motivation for going through the assurance process? I want to give you some real life examples of clients that I've worked with and uh, what's come out of the actual audit itself and therefore a benefit for them. And then we'll wrap up with some conclusions. Next slide, please. So this is Tuf Nord. It was, uh, the company is now uh, over 150 years old, being formed in the 1800s by the three associations which you see at the top of the slide. In 2004, those three associations came together and they formed Tuf Nord Agi. Agi is German for group. And you can see that the group is organized according to the seven business verticals, which you see ahead of you. Um, at the bottom left hand corner, you see uh, an organization called Tufnord CERT. CERT stands for certification. And this is the company within the Tufnord group that is responsible for issuing all global certifications, one of which is ISO 14064. Next slide, please. So we're, we're currently in 72 countries around the world and we employ greater than 13,000 employees. Um, our hub for our Middle Eastern operations is based in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, but we also have offices in Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. So we have a great presence in the Middle East as well as Europe, uh, the US, uh, Southeast Asia, Asia as a whole and Latin America. Next slide, please. And the, and the next one, please. So what is verification? 
It's the systematic, independent and documented process for the evaluation of a greenhouse gas assertion against agreed verification criteria. Next, please. Verification is the process of confirming whether a statement about an actual circumstance or past performance is true or correct. Only statements about actual performance, events or circumstances can be verified. And both greenhouse gas inventories and greenhouse gas projects may be verified. So Ajit has spoken with you about greenhouse gas inventories, which is covered by ISO 14064 part one. It also has, there's a second part to the standard, so ISO 14064 part two, which is solely for the quantification or the calculation of emissions reductions from projects itself. So for example, if you were to build a solar farm and you wanted to realize the, the emissions reductions by not using fossil fuels anymore, but rather using renewable energy, you could use part two of the standard to actually calculate those. And part three of the standard, which, which we're going to talk about in a few moments, is uh, the standard used for verification. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So the output from the overall verification process is a report, a statement, and also a certificate. So part one is the engagement, and really the most important parts within the engagement are the scopes, which Ajit has described extremely well, scopes one, two, and three. So I, I'm not going to go into that again. The standard, which we know is ISO 14064, um, and the materiality. Now, the best way to describe materiality in engineering terms would be tolerance. So what level of tolerance does a verifier have to use should the data and the evidence not be matching? So to give you an example of this, generally speaking, uh, clients choose either five or 10% materiality. So let's go with a 5% materiality and materiality is always applied to the global carbon footprint of an organization. So for example, let's assume uh, for ease of calculation that the global carbon footprint of an organization is 100 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2E. At a 5% materiality, that's five tons, 5% 5 of 100. So during the verification process, we make materiality our friend. And should the data and the evidence not be matching for whatever reason, the verifier knows they have this five tons in their back pocket, which they can use should it be required. After we've established the, the elements contained with, within one, um, we have an initial data check. So the client sends us all of the data, uh, both raw and calculated. So the raw data in terms of maybe the amount of fuel or, or whatever, the calculated emissions, and we use that to generate our verification plan. Some people call it an audit plan. Now, the main part of the audit plan itself is the timetable for the audit and also the amount of evidence that we want to see. Now, in some cases, depending on the, the complexity of the carbon footprint and the number of scopes, um, we need people from various departments within the client's organization. And now, if it's a two day audit, for example, we do not want to have these people sitting around for two entire days um, just because we need them for a one or two hour slot. So we try our best to to ensure that we're um, making the audit as efficient as possible. Next, uh, next one, please, John. Thank you. So then we come to the actual site visit. Now, the main objective of the site visit is to check that the evidence which the client provides us with, so it could be electricity invoices, um, it, it could be the amount of fuel that they're using, matches with the primary data which they've used to calculate the emissions. Another requirement within part three of ISO 14064 is that we check the processes in place. So if you have a a SAP or another ERP system. Some clients have software to calculate their footprints. If you have any of this, uh, we need to check the processes which are there. At the end of the site visit, there's always a closing meeting. And during that closing meeting, we present the findings orally. And then the client receives an official findings report as soon as possible after the audit in which they have to respond to any findings. Next slide. Uh, next uh, point, please. Thank you. After the site visit, 
the auditor works with the client to close the findings and then finalize both the raw data and the emissions. Next, please. Once stage four is over, um, the, the role of the auditee is essentially over for the time being. What then happens is the auditor has to write a very comprehensive report in which um, he or she has to document information about the company, all of the findings which were raised, and the auditor's justification for closing those findings. Next, please. Now, before anything can be released to the client, um, the, the entire audit has to undergo a technical review, and this is conducted by a senior assessor based in Germany. Now, in order for this to happen, the auditor has to submit various documents, uh, such as the audit report, the finalized emissions calculations, any handwritten notes. And at that point, the person conducting the technical review may require further information. If the auditor is not able to supply that information, they, are, they will essentially go back to the client. Next, please. The assurance statement. So there are three types of assurance statement. There's a negative one, in which case it was very obvious the client wasn't ready for verification, may not really have been interested in verification. The auditors were not supplied with enough tea or coffee. You know, all of this could uh, could could lead to that sort of outcome. Or there's a, uh, a positive a verification, which generally speaking is what the client uh, will receive, where everything was fine. And the final option is a positive with limitations. So if we go back to our friend materiality, if we imagine that we're in a position where we were not able to close some of the findings because it was out, the error which we discovered was outside of the materiality level, we may say you receive a positive verification, but we do not offer verification over the following emission sources. Next, please, John. So finally, we come to the, the report itself. So the lead auditor who carried out the, the audit uh, signs the report on behalf of Tuf Nord in this particular case. Now, some of these reports can be quite lengthy, 70, 80, 90 pages. Um, so you wouldn't really want to put that onto your website because it, it may also have some confidential information in there. So companies will often put the assurance statement, which is one or two pages, which contains the pertinent information, but doesn't disclose anything confidential. Next, please. So why would you want to have your carbon footprint verified? Next, please. Next. Legislation. So in the UK, for example, which is where I'm, I'm currently based, um, there, there was a law passed in 2010 which requires any stock listed company to publish their scope one and scope two emissions. You may also want to uh, align with your, your own business strategy or policies and regulations which you have in place. Next, please. CSR, so for corporate social responsibility, reasons for company image, there may be stakeholders, uh, stakeholder pressure as well. As we know, many thanks to Gutta, Thun uh, Gutta Thunberg and, and her, her friends, uh, climate change is, is really at the top of the agenda at the moment. And so businesses obviously have various stakeholders. They could be internal, external, and it may well be that companies want to look at their carbon footprint because of stakeholder pressure. Next, please. Credibility. Um, Irrespective of the data that we're talking about, whether it be sustainability data, financial data, having it assured by an independent third party increases confidence in that data. Um, your organization may want to seek external investment. Now, most investors these days are very concerned about the impact of climate change on a business which they may be investing in. So if you've had your carbon footprint calculated, by guys at, at South Pole, for example, to then have that audited by a third party will bring you a great deal of credibility to potential investors. And the final box, please. Image. I don't think there's any shame in admitting that one of the reasons why companies go through this process is to use it as a positive marketing tool. Um, it may also give you first, uh, first mover advantage in a very crowded business place. Uh, business marketplace, 
And finally, it could offer your company or differentiation against their potential competitors. Next slide, please. And next, please. So here you'll see some headlines which were published by some very well-known um, publications, newspapers, and, and some magazines. And you can see that they've essentially taken clients who have published their carbon footprint and, um, and kind of cast it in a negative way. So one of the ways of avoiding these headlines is to go through a verification process, which gives you confidence that the data which you're putting into the public domain um, has is, is accurate and can be backed up by a third party. Next, please. Next. So what are the potential risks of non-verification? The greenhouse gas inventory could have been incorrectly calculated and reported. Next. In the case of mandatory reporting schemes, such as the, the one in the UK, a director within the business must, must attest to the accuracy of the greenhouse gas inventory. Next, please. Now, in the case of this uh, legislation, which I discussed in the UK, um, the scope one and scope two data sits within the annual report. Within the annual report are also the financial figures of the company, which have generally been audited by, for example, one of the big four accounting firms. You then have your scope one and two data and somebody very senior in the company has to sign this off. Now, I think none of us would be comfortable with putting our signature next to numbers if we're not 100 percent sure that those numbers are accurate. Next, please. So. Apart from suffering reputational damage, if you have developed a marketing campaign around, for example, calculating your carbon footprint, uh, maybe offsetting that carbon footprint, any positive marketing could easily be reversed should the, uh, the data found to be, or the calculations found to be incorrect. Next, please. Now, we, uh, a number of years ago, did a lot of work for a company called Aviva. Um, they are in the UK, at least they sell insurance, but they also invest. Um, they also supply or, or provide pensions. Now, as we know, pensions are long term investments and the and climate change itself has a, a long term impact. So what Aviva were interested in is how seriously do the companies that they take the pension money and invest in take the impact of climate change on their business? So investors themselves may choose not to invest in a company due to the increased risk profile which it faces and which is subject, which, which will affect the, the money that's invested in the company in terms of the return on investment. Next slide, please. What I intend to do now is just pay, uh, provide you with four case studies of clients that I've actually audited myself. And the, the objective is to really help understand the benefits of verification. So this first company, it's a chemicals manufacturer based in Southeast Asia. They have 100 sites globally. During the audit itself, we discovered that instead of reporting the top up of refrigerant gas within the chiller units, they reported the total volume of gas in the chili units. Now, Ajit mentioned earlier on that you use a uh, global warming potential of these gases to calculate the, the CO2 equivalent. Now, some of these gases, for example, SF6, have very, very high global warming potentials. So an inaccuracy uh, which, which we found during this audit would hugely increase the carbon footprint of that particular site. So in this case, it increased the emissions of that site itself by 37%. Next, please. We worked for a European-based logistics company that had a very complex company structure with various divisions. In the data that we received, they reported that they had used 2 million litres of diesel and 4,000 litres of petrol. When we carried out the verification, we discovered in actual fact, it was 5 million litres of diesel and 19 and a half thousand litres of petrol. So the conclusion which you draw from that is that there's some quite poor financial controlling going on within that organisation and a huge underreporting of their greenhouse gas emissions. Next, please. 
We then have a UK industrial equipment manufacturer. They operate in 40 countries around the world. I audited uh, one of their sites in France. And I discovered that the site had never had the gas meter read. So all of the invoicing was, was based on estimated readings. As a result of the audit, we requested that they actually obtain a, a bill from the gas company. Um, and the audit revealed that their gas usage had been overestimated to an equivalent of 100,000 euros. So you can easily see there that as a result of that audit, they've potentially saved 100,000 euros which is far, far greater than the fees which we charge for the audit. Next slide, please, John. Finally, we have a, a garments manufacturer based in Asia. They have 55 uh, sites across the globe. Uh, for their scope on diesel, due to frequent power cuts in this particular country, they use a lot of diesel, not just in the process, but also for generators, uh, should the, the, the grid uh, suffer an outage. So the invoices showed that they had purchased 180,000 litres during the year. The log sheets showed 118,000 was used and they have a storage tank of 30,000 litres on site. So the question which we asked them is, where is the remaining 32,000 litres? Uh, this led to an internal investigation and it was found that, that this diesel was actually leaving the site um, without people knowing about it. Uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, we have a, a lot of experience in carbon and energy, and we operate in over 70 countries around the world, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Given our large presence, we can be a local partner. Next, please. We have a considerable amount of experience in assuring both corporate and product carbon footprints for organizations in a large number of sectors. Next, please. I've given you an overview of why assurance should be a, a key consideration. Next. I've explained what we do during the assurance process itself. Next, please. And why auditing and providing third party assurance has many benefits. These could be to convey certain messages about your company to stakeholders. And it could be to identify savings in greenhouse gas emissions, which also results in cost and efficiency savings. So thank you very much for listening. Um, you have my contact details there, but more importantly, you have uh, the contact details of Mr. Haitham, a colleague of mine who's based in the Middle East. If you have any questions regarding the verification side of things, please contact Mr. Haitham directly. They will, uh, our colleagues in the Middle East will also be in touch with you after the webinar. So on that, I'd like to ha um, hand back to John uh, for any questions and um, further parts of the seminar. Thank you, John. Thanks, Tarsen. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed the case studies, really interesting. And Arjit, thank you as well for the presentation on greenhouse gas accounting. We do have a couple of questions um, which, I'll, which I'll put out there, and I also have a couple of my own which I would like to ask. Um, to start with, I've got a question from James Rosen. Thank you very much, James. Um, and I guess this is for both of you, so maybe you want to have um, uh, both sides of this. But the question is, are company office locations often included in greenhouse gas accounting and verification, or is the focus purely on production sites and factories? Maybe maybe you first, Arjun, and if, if um, Tarsen's got comments, we can go to him. Yeah, sure. So um, on the company office locations, we do include them primarily in company footprints. So this is really a question of what type of footprint you're going for. Um, with a company footprint, you would include your company office locations. Um, more often than not, production sites and factories, if they're owned by the company, so ownership is particularly important, but if they're owned uh, by the company, uh, they would be considered part of your company footprint. However, many corporations um, tend to have third-party manufacturers or third-party factories, um, and so it wouldn't necessarily always be included in the company footprint. Um, when it comes to products, um, you definitely would include your production sites and factories, mainly because it's a direct part of the um, product supply chain. And so for products, definitely. And for companies, um, it depends on ownership. Um, Tars, did you have uh, yeah. any input here? Ajit, thank you. Yeah, uh, just to really echo what Ajit said, but from a verification perspective, as you can imagine, if you've got a company with, with 40 sites around the world, we would not be 
verifying the data physically going to 40 sites. It, it just wouldn't be time and also cost efficient. So when we talk about offices, if uh, generally speaking, we would audit the head office, um, but any other sort of satellite offices wouldn't really fall into the, the audit program simply because we have to look at the emissions which are coming out of these offices. And generally speaking, production facilities uh, result in far more efficient uh, emissions than, than an office itself. Thanks, Tarsen. Thanks, Arjit. There's another question here as well from Ibrahim. Thank you, Ibrahim, um, which is around, I guess, how efficient is this? So um, it wraps up a question I had as well, which is for you, Tarsen, how long does verification take? And Ibrahim also asks, is there a software that can make this verification more efficient? Um, so the time taken for the verification itself really depends on the number of scopes which you have and also the emission sources within those scopes which the company are including and really how experienced the company is. Uh, so, for example, if you've had a company that's um, been calculating their carbon footprint for a number of years or they've had help in doing all of that, um, then the process doesn't take as long as if you've got a first time company who have decided to calculate the footprint themselves um, and it's all very new. So, so that's really the answer to that. Um, what I would advocate is the use of a consultant because it does make the verification process a lot easier uh, in terms of the from the verifier's time and obviously the less time we spend on the verification itself, the more efficient it becomes and frankly speaking, the, the more of a cost advantage it has. Um, I'm not really best placed to talk about software itself. Yes, we, we some clients do use software. Some of them, uh, they have pros and cons. Um, I think one of the, the biggest criticisms I would uh, lay at the, the, the door of software use, which you wouldn't have if you used a consultant, is one of the things that we have to do is we have to verify the emissions factor. As Arjit mentioned earlier on, the way you calculate your footprint is you take your raw data and you multiply it by an emissions factor. And that emissions factor has to be relevant to the year that you're actually basing your data on. So if you're calculating your footprint in 2020, for 2020, you must use emissions factors that are relevant to 2020. Now, um, a lot of this software is, is, is a black box and it doesn't allow verifiers to actually see what the emissions factors are. Um, whereas if you were using a consultant to calculate it, you would have that information readily available. Perfect. Thanks, thanks Tarsen. Uh, if you have anything to add there, Ajit, otherwise I have one more question. I'll keep going. Um, so the question, I, I guess, is actually for both of you to finish out on, and um, we'll start with Arjit, and I, that is you know, what type of greenhouse gas accounting and verification um, do you see as most common in this market? So is that large entities, is that specific projects, or is it actual products itself? So Arjit, if you can fill us in from the greenhouse gas accounting perspective, it would be interesting to hear from you, Tarsen, in terms of what you see uh, on the verification too. Sure, thanks for that question, John. Um, so uh, from a greenhouse gas accounting perspective, the most common one is unsurprisingly entities or maybe surprisingly, but um, we've been doing entity greenhouse gas accounting for um, a long time now. Um, it was, uh, it's often the most common type of accounting that's undertaken um, because we're generally working with corporations. Um, corporations uh, really understand um, the importance of uh, marketing and sustainability um, for their operations, and particularly in this new age, it's it's a very important part of what they do. Um, and so, uh, entity accounting is definitely the most common. I would say of late, product accounting has become a bigger th is becoming um, quite a big thing as well. Um, particularly with um, green products and eco-labeling as well. Um, product accounting is is definitely a big thing um, in addition to that. Um, but greenhouse gas accounting for corporations is also, is, is still, I would say, the most common type of greenhouse gas accounting, primarily because um, many corporations are stepping into um, things, uh, concepts like net zero and, and trying to really um, build uh, an emissions profile and understand 
uh, their impact on the environment and understand it. And that's really the first step, as I mentioned in my presentation near the beginning, of um, identifying what sort of targets you want to set, what sort of interventions um, you want to undertake. Um, it's it's really important to understand what your emissions profile looks like. Um, Tarsan, did you want to cover something yeah. on the verification side? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the verification work which we do is driven by legislation. So if companies have to do this, they, they will they will ultimately do it. But a lot of the work is also coming out of Europe. So Europe is, I, I would say, has really um, pushed forward this this entire agenda, um, as well as uh, Australia and, and New Zealand as well. Um, and companies who are interacting with other companies in Europe, for example, are, are now increasingly seeing the value of this, partly because they have partners in Europe that are, are also requiring this. We're also seeing a huge uptake in product carbon footprinting. Um, John mentioned during his opening presentation that millennials are very much taking the impact of climate change on their daily lives um, incredibly seriously. Um, and we're finding actually when we ask clients, why do you want the product carbon footprint of this carton of orange juice, for example? Why do you want that verified? They're basically feeding back and saying, well, consumers in the US, in Europe, in Australia and, and, and other countries are saying, well, I want to know what is the carbon footprint of this carton of orange juice? And if it's less than the next one. I will be willing to pay a little bit more for that because I know that actually I, in a small way, by buying this carton of juice, I'm reducing the carbon footprint, uh, my own personal carbon footprint, but I'm also having a, a more holistic impact on climate change as a whole. So uh, products certainly becoming uh, very important. Um, but there's also in the UK, for example, where, where I'm based at the moment, if you want to apply for a local government tender. In the tender document itself, it asks about your sustainability criteria and do you calculate your own carbon footprint? And if you do, prove it. So um, companies are becoming more and more aware that if they want to win work, they have to not only calculate, but have it verified as well. Thanks, Tarsim. Thanks, Arjit. Very comprehensive answer. Um, and we have we have one more, so so let's let's answer this, and that that'll be the last question, and we'll, we'll conclude the webinar. Um, more detailed, and uh, I am going to, I guess, pop this one to you first, Tarsin. Which one is more comprehensive, the ISO one four zero six four dash three TUF Nord standard or GRI reporting? Okay, so firstly. 14064 part three is not a TUF Nord standard. It's an ISO standard. So any company, any verification company around the world who wants to have their carbon footprint verified will be using ISO 14064 part three. The GRI uh, it stands for the Global Reporting Initiative, and that relates to the assurance or, the, or that relates to sustainability reports which is very different to what we're talking about today. Um, so I, I hope so you can't you cannot compare the two. They're different standards. Thanks, Thanks Tarsen. Great. Good, 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 good that we answered that. Please feel free to to drop an email to us if there's anything outstanding. We'll come back to you as well. So that concludes the webinar. Thank you very much, Tarsen. Thank you very much, Arjit, for your time. Um, thank you very much to to all the attendees that were able to to join the call. We appreciate that and we look forward to hearing from you and we will um, have uh, the slides, I believe, available as well for, for circulation upon request. So thank you very much for joining us and we wish you a good day. John, thank you very much. Ajit, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tarsan. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you.